Take your Bibles and turn to uh, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Before you panic, I'm not preaching on what this passage is normally preached on. So, Malachi chapter 3, pick up verse 6. I guess I'll be touching on it a little bit. But. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. We're going to read from 6 down through verse 10 for our text. It says, For I am the Lord, I changed not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. I know many a times this passage is preached on giving of tithes and giving. And one can learn from it. I mean, I, I believe doctrinally this is a Old Testament passage under law. But I also believe the tithe was before the law. and I think it's a very good principle for the Christian to go by today. Although you are giving in the New Testament that one should give as he purposes in his heart. But that's not really the focus of what I want to concentrate in this passage this morning. I want to preach on is verse 10, where the Lord says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, prove me. Now he's talking about giving and then him blessing there. But I want to look at just more than just that. I want to preach on proving the Lord. Putting the Lord to the test. Put in, when he says, prove me, he says, put me to the test. Put me to the test. As young people, we'd sit there and make a brag. And then the other kid will sit there and say, prove it. Prove it. I don't think you can do it. Prove it. We'll say, prove it. Put it to the test. I want you to prove it. I want you to take and prove this. And the Lord says, prove me now. Prove me. Put it to the test. You'll give your tithes, I'll open the windows of heaven and give you a blessing. You can't say. He says, I'll prove. Now, he challenges them to, to prove them. I want to preach on putting God to the test. Putting God to the test. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take and I'll be with this message. Pray now that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll speak through me. I pray that if there are some that haven't totally committed to walking by faith and going forward and committing, that they will do so today. That they won't just trust you as a half-hearted convenience, but that they'll wholeheartedly trust you. And they'll put you to the test. And they'll see what great blessing it is to live a life of faith, trusting in You. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. It tells us to prove all things. 
In other words, put everything to the test. Take and test it out. Now, you want to be a little bit careful there because there's some things in life you don't want to prove. You don't want to test out. Solomon, through his life, he proved some things he just shouldn't have proved. And uh, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, he says, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with myrrh. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly. You know what folly is? Foolishness and sin. It's the pleasures of sin. Till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven, all the days of their life. Solomon was a fellow that learned things by testing them out. He learned that out of a thousand women, he couldn't find one wise one. Well, how did he learn that? He married a thousand women. I, I want to suggest you test that theory. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's, that's not the direction that you should go. And he would test out mirth and folly. You know, uh, teenagers go through a time of fear where they want to experiment. The ex they call it the experimental stage. They want to experiment things. That's a dangerous time for teenagers. It's a dangerous time for young men, young men and young women. They want to experience some things in life. And that's when they, they, they sit there and think that taking that cigarette, oh, I'll try it. I'll take a puff. Well, that marijuana. Well, I, let's see what a high feels like. I want, I want to see what they're all talking about. I want to experiment. Or maybe it's fornication and adultery. And they want to mess around and fool around with sin and play around with it. They, they, they want to walk up and they think that they can experiment some and walk back from it. The Bible calls them a simple man, a foolish man. One that lacks understanding. They're playing with sin. They're playing with folly. And uh, Solomon messed around with folly and he proved it. He tested it. He tested the experience of folly and it took his heart away from God. And he, he messed up. He messed his life up. He could have been one of the greatest men that ever lived. With his wisdom and the way he started out and serving God, he could have been one of the greatest men to ever live. Well, what do we think about Psalm? He's the king that started out right and ended up bad. That's his reputation. Despite all his wisdom. Despite all his wisdom. He gets to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, and with all his experimentation and everything that he learned, you know what he learned? All that stuff's a bunch of vanity. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's what he learned. He learned all that sin does not bring any satisfaction. Sin never satisfies. And it's never content with how much you give it. It always wants more. You go down the road of sin, you'll go farther and farther and farther and farther. Why? Because it never satisfies. You're looking for it to satisfy, and it never will. It never will. Don't prove sin. Don't test it out. Don't even mess with it. You know the best way to get victory over sin? Never start. Never start. The Bible says to a young man, flee also. You full lust. This world capitalizes on your lust. It wants you to test it out. It wants you to play with it. They can just start getting you to play with it. They got you. Once you mess with it, you're obsessed with it. I'm like that. I get obsessed with things. I'm a, I have an obsession right now. I, I, mean, I got it in my mind. I'm going to figure out how to catch whitefish and lake trout from a kayak. 
in this lake. I've gone out several times and failed every time. And I am obsessed with that. We went out, we went to a picnic yesterday up there at uh, Big Arm State Park, and we were out kayaking, and I went out there trying to catch whitefish, and there are some different boats out there gathering around, and I know they're coming in. There's them, all them fishermen wasn't out there without a reason. Nobody was catching anything, neither was I. But I tried, and I failed. I came back, and she's trying to take a nap. I'm sitting there watching videos how to catch lake trout and whitefish. Now, I mean, just doing all this research. I got all these plans in my mind right now how I'm going to prove these theories and test them out. Okay? I even was looking at nautical maps of the floor of Flathead Lake trying to figure out my next plan of attack on these jokers. Now, I'm going to get one. I'm going to figure it out. Okay? I'm obsessed with it. Now, I just can't leave it alone. All right? What's the problem? You know, sins like that. Once you start messing around with it, you may not get the results you want, but you're obsessed. You can't leave it alone. You can't leave it alone. You can't leave it alone. Now, that's the way it is. Don't, don't prove that. Don't prove that. You don't have to prove that theory. But proving something, I mean, when it comes to proving the right thing, you need to put it to the test. You know, Thomas Edison had to take an experiment with the light bulb 1,000 times before he successfully made a markable light bulb. Now, that's kind of a general number. They don't really know how many times he failed. But he failed many times before he actually got a marketable light bulb. Uh, that's when it comes to proving God... We all put it to the test. And until you successfully prove something, you're not taken serious. You have to prove it. You have to show it to be so. And the Lord says, prove me. Put me to the test. Now He's going to show it so, if you'll just prove it. But you have to put it to the test. Now, how does one... Prove God. How does one prove God? First of all, number one, you prove God by trusting Him and obeying Him to do, do the things God's way. Have you ever tried doing things God's way and seeing how it turns out? You want to prove God? Then listen to Him and do it his way. Take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Now the Jews were given a lot of different ways they were supposed to do things. Amen? They were commanded by the law to take and be a peculiar people and with being a peculiar people there are certain ways they had to do things to prove to the rest of the world that they were God's people. And they were a unique people. They were a different people. They were a people that God blessed because they kept His laws and His commandments. Now, near in the book of Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were young eunuchs that were taken to uh, Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, a Gentile king, that was put in subjection under this Gentile king. And they were supposed to take and go through this process that this king went through him that was contrary to the laws that God had put him under as a Jewish people. And he wants them to eat all these things that was unclean to him. And look at what it says in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he may not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who have appointed you your meat and your drink, for why should he see your face worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. 
Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let your countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children, which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Now scientifically, I'm sure this thing, any... Um, dietary person would look at these two diets and say, no, this isn't going to work. This, this isn't going to work. You're not going to take and fatten up and look better than those eat in the king's diet. I mean, they had every nutritionist on the board there given the diet that they should go by. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stand up and they sit there and say, you know what? Serving God is a better way. Let's prove it. Let's put it to the test. Test us. See what God can do. Prove it. Let me tell you something. Sometimes as Christians, you need to learn to obey God and do what He tells you to do and put it to the test. See if He won't bless you. See if He won't take care of you. Do things God's way. Quit listening to the world. Quit trying to do things their way. Do it God's way. Prove it. See if it doesn't work. Let me tell you, it works. It works. I, I've, watched, I've watched lost do the world's way so many times and seen the end result of it. To me, they've proved their way. Alcohol has never fixed anybody's job. Marijuana has never fixed anyone's job. All it has done is make them undependable, unreliable, and bad at their job. I've never seen it fix any of their marriages. I found something that does work. But that stuff doesn't work. It does not work. Will you prove God's way? Will you put Him to the test to see if His way will work? The Bible says in Psalms 18.30, As for God, His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is tried. He is, he is a buckler to all those that trust Him. You know what He's saying? He's saying, my way is perfect. This thing has been tried, true, and will work every time. Will you prove it? Will you put it to the test? You have to put it to the test. You have to try it to see if it works. Will you try it? You know, many people, won't, they won't even try it. So, uh, they won't even read this book to find out what God's way is, much less put it to the test. Much less put it to the test. Put it to the test. You, if you obey the things in this Bible, you'll have the best marriage ever. If you put this Bible to the test, your marriage will be the greatest marriage ever. I got the solution for everybody's marriage problem. The Word of God. If you'll put it to the test. Put it to the test. Prove it. Now here's one that you don't want to prove. You don't want to prove the wrath of God. You know what you don't want to do? You don't want to test God's patience with His wrath. By the Lord's very patient. He's very merciful. He's very kind. He's also very righteous, very holy, and He does have wrath. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 through 11, the Bible says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath 
they shall not enter into my rest. You know what some people will do? That Bible says that if you reject Jesus Christ, His Son, the wrath of God abide upon you. And they say, prove it. When they die, they wake up in a lake of fire burning forever, and the Lord proved it. And they said, okay, quit proving it. But it's too late. They'll prove it. Don't prove the wrath of God. Don't test them with His wrath. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible says, warns the Christian and anybody else, this is a general truth, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also will reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Don't, don't try to prove that one. You cannot sin and get away with it. So well, let me go out and sin and see if that's so. I wouldn't do that if I was you. I wouldn't prove that one. I wouldn't prove that one. I wouldn't test that one. I wouldn't put them to the test on that. The Bible says in verse 8, For he that soweth to flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know what I'm trying to prove? I'm trying to prove that if I reap something good, God will take care of me. And that God will reward me in heaven. Now, I want to try to prove that one. I'll, I'll wait till the judgment seat of Christ and see if my righteousness will be rewarded. He says I will. He says it'll, I'll reap if I faint not. So I'm going to put him to the test. I've put my life aside where I want to put him to the test on that. I want to see if he'll reward me for a life of serving him. Well, how do I prove him with that? I have to give a life of serving him. I have to prove it. I have to put it to the test. You say, well, don't you want to prove a life of living after the flesh? Nope. I'm not going to prove that one. I'll take his word for it. I'm not going to prove that one. Which one are you going to prove? You're going to prove one or the other. Have you put God to the test? Will you prove Him to see if He'll do what He says He'll do? Number three, prove God with provision. Now in Malachi 3.10, He says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know what he's saying? He's saying if you will take and do as I've told you to do, and he commanded the children of Israel to tithe, and that's the way they were supposed to take care of his work. He says if you will prove me and put me to the test, I'll prove to you that I'll take care of you. Let's make that relevant today. There's a saying that preachers say, and I say this too. Why? Because I've proved it. I've put it to the test. Here's the saying. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. If you ever do, let me know. I've never been able to do it. Anything that the Lord lays on my heart to give, if I give it, even when I think, man, I can't afford to do that, He always gives me back more. Now, I'm not going to go... I, I had one preacher say, I, I, I play paycheck roulette. Sometimes I throw my whole paycheck in to see what God will do. He said he never could outgive God either. Now, I, I'm not suggesting somebody do that. I say... You give according to what you purpose in your heart and what God lays on your heart. But if God lays it on your heart, don't worry about the results. He'll take care of you. And uh, 
And the Lord will provide for you. The Bible says, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Many a times we're not willing to prove God on that one. We're not willing to trust Him that He can take care of us. I mean, I'll tell you, sometimes when, it, when the bills are thick and it's hard and it's hard to get by, you look at that checkbook and the account number and you get your check and you see the tithe and you say, man, I could really use that tithe. If I don't give that tithe, then I can't. And there, there you start wondering if it was right, but the Lord's convicting you that you should. And you know what you'll wind up doing? You'll keep it. You don't, you don't put God to the test. He'll take care of you. Don't you trust Him? He said He'll provide all you need. Do you trust Him? Say, preacher, that's easier said than done. Hey man, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there where the paycheck didn't amount to the same as the bills. It was a bit under. And you have to sit there and pray and wait and see how God takes care of you. I remember one time, me and... uh, Rebecca, we were having a hard time. And we had just bought a house up in Kalispell. Uh, Obama fixed the economy real good. And, and I was trying to shovel. I was leaving work. There was no work at work. So I was leaving to shovel snow off roofs and stuff just to provide food on the table. Doing everything that I could. The bills was more than the money coming in. And we got down, that cupboard was bare. It was bare. I walked out of church one day. We went to church. I came out of church one day. and The back of our truck was filled with boxes of food. I didn't tell anybody I was going through a hard time. Somebody knew. Somebody filled our truck up with food. I didn't have money to pay the groceries. Couldn't go buy it. I paid all our bills, but I didn't have the money to go get groceries. It was provided. It was provided. You say, what is it? That's the Lord took care of our needs. I ate more brown rice. So... Now, your needs and your wants are two different things. Brown rice is not the greatest taste in rice. Whoever that was filled that thing with brown rice. <laughs> I ate more brown rice that two weeks. <laughs> but, uh, but hey, it was food. It was food. I mean, when you're in need, your needs may not be all your wants. Amen? He provided the needs. Psalm 78, 11 through 20, the Bible says, and this is talking about the general, uh, this is a recap of the children of Israel. It says, pick up verse 11 and read down through there. It says, And for God has works and his wonders that he had showed them, marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also He led them with a cloud and all the night with the light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against Him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And so what's the psalm saying? He's saying God did all these wonderful works on brought water out of a rock, divided the Red Sea. They seen all the plagues of Egypt and deliver them out all the provisions that God did for them. Yet they sinned more. And they tempted God in their heart, asking meat for their lust. Yet they spake against God, and He said, God, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? He said, even after He did all these things, He said, Lord can't provide for us. He can't take care of us. I mean, this big 
group of a million so people out in the desert, God can't provide a table in the wilderness. God was wroth with them. Sent fiery serpents because of that. Why? Because of their sin of not wanting to prove the Lord and test Him with His provision. You know what the passage says? You look down there in Psalm 78. I read this the other day. I got deeply convicted about it. In verse 40 and 41 it says, How oft did they provoke Him in the wilderness and grieve Him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They, it says they limited him. In other words, they didn't trust God that he could do something beyond their understanding. Beyond their understanding. How often do we do that? How often do we look at a problem and we say, boy, that's impossible. That'll never happen. I that that can't happen. That's impossible. And we limit what God can do for us. I wonder how many times in my ministry I've limited the Lord by doubt in his ability to provide. I'm not saying be careless. I'm saying don't doubt God's ability. If He wants to provide something, He can provide it. He can provide everything you need. There's nothing... I mean, I I look at the hospital bills coming in and I start thinking practically. Practically ain't a good way to think when you look at all the hospital bills. Because I can do math. You know, up to date, all the hospital bills from her cancer has been taken care of. And it really hasn't hit us. Say, how much is that? Well, if I didn't count the deductions and everything, that'd be, what, nearly a hundred grand at this point? And God's taking care of one, one, one. What? You can take care of it. But boy, you sure don't think that way, do you, as a Christian? You look at that stuff and you start doubting. The Lord says, you know what? I've always took care of you before. Why don't I read that and it's like the Lord said, I've always took care of you before. What's your problem? Why are you worried about this stuff? Forget about it. <laughs> All right, Lord, I get it. You know, why are you worried about this stuff? Last of all, number four, prove him with your life and your health. Prove him with your life and your health. Take your Bible and turn to Second Chronicles chapter sixteen. Plumb test with provision, but why don't we just go all the way? Why don't you just prove them with your life? Say, what do you mean? Well, take your Bible and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. King Asa, he was a, actually a good king. And he did some amazing things. The Lord says some amazing things about him. Uh, But he messes up toward the end of his life. And the reason he messes up is because he starts doubting the Lord's ability. And uh, if you... uh, Pick up verse 6. It says, And the nation was destroyed... And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah, Benjamin, and out of all the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. 
and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them in Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord God was with them. So Asa was serving God. God was blessing him. So they gathered themselves to, to Jerusalem in the third month in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. Now, if you read down there, I want the passage where it says uh, that where Asa messes up. Oh, it's verse chapter 16. I'm sorry, that's verse 15, chapter 15. But the Lord was blessing him. Now, verse 16, ben Hada comes up against, the king of Syria comes up against him. And when he comes up against him, Asa takes and goes and hires the king of, uh, hires, um, let's see, where, where is it? Pick up verse uh, 4. And Ben Hadan hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote Ijan and Dan and Abamim and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it, they left off building of Raymond and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber therewith wherewith Basha was building, and he built there with Geba and Mizpah. So it works. He hires Ben-Hada. The king of Israel comes against him. He hires uh, Ben-Hadan, the king of Syria, to take and go up against them. And this plan of his works. Yet it displeases the Lord. Look at verse 7. And at that time Hananiah the Syria came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubans a huge host, which were very many chariots, a previous battle that the Lord delivered them from, and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show Himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now what, what Asa did was the Lord did a great delivery for him. But the next time he was in battle, he, he sits there and looks at his finances and figures out a smart way to defeat. Baasha, king of Israel. And he doesn't do things the way God... He doesn't trust the Lord to take care of him again. He does it his own way. And the Lord's displeased with that. Why? Because he didn't trust the Lord with his life and his kingdom. He didn't trust the Lord with it. He didn't put the Lord to the test say, okay, Lord, you deliver him. And you know what he does after the seer does this? He's wroth and gets mad about this. Asa gets mad. And then Asa gets diseased in the feet in the same chapter. And when he gets diseased in the feet, he doesn't go to the Lord. He doesn't trust the Lord. What does he do? The Bible says he goes to the physicians and trusts the physicians. It says, uh, says, uh, Verse 12, And Asa in the thirty ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. I want to challenge you something. I'm not telling you not to go to doctors. I'm, that's not what I'm preaching. To you. But here's the challenge. Will you trust the Lord with your life? Not just provisions, but with your life. Say, Lord, I'm going to prove you. Here's my life. I expect you. I'm going to serve you. And if I serve you, everything should come out right. I'll trust you. You can have my life. I remember listening to a 
message by Lester Roloff when I was young. I was about Nathaniel's age. And I listened to that message, and it was about surrendering one's life. I remember surrendering my life that day to the Lord. I told the Lord, Lord, I want you to have my life. It's yours. I'll trust you with it. Now, I didn't surrender to preach that day. I just surrendered to let the Lord have my life. I didn't get saved that day. I was already saved. But I let the Lord have my life. I said, Lord, you can have my life. I want to live a life pleasing to you. I want to live a life that you want me to live. Christian, you need to surrender your life to the Lord. You need to prove it. Let me tell you something. After so many years of serving God, I know I've had my ups and downs. But I've never regret, I do not regret serving God with my life. That's a blessed life. It's been a blessed life serving God. And my life is what? Maybe two-thirds over? Lord will, maybe two-thirds over. I don't know. You never know. But uh, who knows how much longer I got. But it's a blessed life. Will you prove God? Will you put Him to the test? We give Him not only the provisions, not only your pleasures and desires, but your life. Trust them in all things. Prove them. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. He shall direct thy paths. Trust Him with the matter. Say, well, I, I, I'm coming up with this health problem. I might die. Well, prove them. Give it over to the Lord. See what He does with it. For the Christian, death isn't really all that bad. But maybe the Lord ain't done with you. If you give Him life and He ain't done with you, well then He's going to do what He wants with you. But give Him your life. Trust Him with you. Alright, it's yours. You can have it. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Will you put the Lord to the test? Will you prove Him? For you to prove Him, it means you have to commit. There in Malachi, He wants them to commit the tithe so they could prove Him that He would do what He said. I want you to commit your life to Him. Prove Him. Give Him your life. Say, Lord, everything about my life, I want to do it Your way. Total surrender, total commitment to you. Done doing things my way. Here it is. You take it from here on forth. Commit. Let them have it. Prove them. And see what He does with it. I'll tell you, you young people in this congregation, it is best for you to prove Him now than to wait till you're old. Prove them now. Don't be a Solomon living your life, proving your own theories. Prove the Lord. Put them to the test. And He'll prove to you some things beyond anything that you ever dreamed. You don't really have a piano player, but I'm just going to give you a few minutes to pray. We're not going to do a song of invitation. I want you to sit in your seat. And if the Lord spoken to your heart, why don't you just commit to Him and let Him prove some things to you. Lord, I pray that we'll trust You always. I pray that You'll take and uh, be with the congregation. Maybe I don't know who this message was aimed at. I don't know if there was an individual here that needed it. 
I pray that if they're doubting, if they're uncommitted, that they'll take and commit their life to You, that they'll commit everything about their life to You, and that they'll put You to the test and see that serving You is the most blessed and abundant life they can ever have. I pray that they'll take and commit. I pray that they'll put You to the test, that they'll take and uh, not be messing around with these things that they shouldn't mess around with, but that they'll take and uh, commit to serving You and surrender to You. Live a life that's pleasing to You and prove You through their life where the world can see that God is working in their life, doing something in their life, that's something that You've done because they put You to the test. And He can, as He told Asa, that You can show Yourself strong in them because they put You to the test. I pray that You'll do that. I pray that you You'll do that with some individuals here today. And we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.